All right. Today is May 3rd. The location is Ocean Shores, Washington. And today we're going to be interviewing Robert Smythe. And my name is Pat Perry, and Robert Smythe is my dad. So we're going to start with Dad. Tell us a little bit about your history, where you came from, where you were born, and when. Okay, my name, I was named Robert, uh, but most of my life all was called Bobby. It was more friendly and very nice. I always liked that. But anyway, I was born in a, a house in Roslyn, uh, Houston Street, Northern Ireland, Belfast. And back then the house had two bedrooms and uh, two brothers and me, which meant uh, one bed for two guys. What uh, year was it, Dad? Yeah. Now the house had an outside toilet. You had to undo a couple of doors and go out the backyard and way at the end, as far away from the house as you could get them, that's where the toilets were. So if you needed to go in the middle of the night, it was quite an experience getting all the way out there, especially if it was raining or something like that. Now, you've got to remember this was 17th of August in 1924. When I was born, that was a long time ago. And so being in that house, we had no electricity, we had water, and everything, the heating and light was all natural gas or coal gas, not natural gas, coal gas. And we had these large systems where they stored all of the coal gas and then they piped out all over town. And to get the coal gas, you had to put a penny in the meter. And so you got just about enough uh, gas for to make a cup of tea for uh, maybe about three pennies, which was a lot of money back then. But, and that's the way we were brought up. We had gas chandeliers lit up in our parlor. And most of the, the people that lived in Belfast, at least where I lived, they all had a parlor. And you know, the houses weren't that big, but they always had a room set aside as they called a parlor. And that was all the best little china cabinets and uh, seating that we had was in the parlor. Kids weren't allowed in the parlor and only guests could be there and yet everybody was crowded into a living room that had a great big coal fire to keep, to keep the house warm. And so everything was done on the stove, a little tiny stove about, oh, 18 inches wide. Mother never cooked anything because the oven was so tiny. And so all of the, the buns and the bread and everything was bought out of the little home bakery that was nearby. So when I was old enough to go to school, my brother and Jim, they, they went to Houston Street School, which had a, a kindergarten, but mom didn't want me to go with them. So I went to the nearest church school and uh, McQuiston was the name of the church. And it had a big circle in the middle of the assembly point and then that whole circle was divided up into portions of different class stages. And so they put me in there. And after the first day was over, mom went to collect me and they said, was he a good boy? And they said, was he a good boy? When, they, when we asked him what his name was, he told us to mind our own business. <laughs> he had heard my mother use that expression, mind your own business. But the one that was the outstanding thing about that whole school was I'd gotten a possession of a razor blade that had one side on it, like the, the new blades that came out. And I came to school with that one blade, that one 
blade out of a razor. And so when I wanted to get everybody's attention and they were taking all, all the other classes now were in session and you could hear that background of all the different teachers droning in a message, I wanted a little attention. So I stood up and I remember it well, as small as I was, I stood up, pulled up my sleeve and held my hand up like that. And I got that razor blade and announced that I was the brave man. And I would start doing like that and missing my hand. And I was just so involved in that I actually hit the palm of my hand. And oh all this, <laughs> this whole blood was running down my hands. And the, and the girls were screaming and everything just turned to madness. And then the, all the other classes shut up and a couple of doctors came running over and said, oh my God, look at the hand. And I cut, cut with that razor blade oh and all the blood out was my one big thing that I remember from McQuiston School, believe it or not. Oh my gosh. And then as time went past and the war came along, and so England did nothing for the opposed the Germans. Ireland was part of the English government, so we had nothing either. And so in England, they, they had old uniforms from World War I, the old khaki uniforms, and they gave these out to home. They were the home guard, and they were the ones to meet, get ready to meet the Germans. So the only thing they had was farm implements, pitchforks, and they didn't have any rifles or anything. So all the home guard to oppose the German invasion that was eventually to come, we all had pitchforks. And in Ireland, we actually got little old rifles from World War I, one single shot to put in the rifle. And so we went out to drill every Sunday. And anyway, this one Sunday, they came early with the truck and picked me up at the house. And I, they told me to get my uniform on and bring my, bring my gun. How old were you at that time? Pardon? How old would you have been at that time? How old were you? Oh, it was probably 15 and a half, something like that. And anyway, so we got on the truck and we went out to the edge of Belfast and there was a little a ranch house, a little farm out there. And they got us all out of the truck and you know, they had the sign, no talking. And then we all gathered around a tight circle and they said that the Germans had landed at this farm and that our job was to take the, to attack the Germans because they wouldn't be ex expecting us. So we crawled about a half a mile closer to this, this farm. And so we all had our rifles all at the ready, but somebody said, where's the bullets? Oh my God. <laughs> See, they didn't trust us young kids with firearms, with, with bullets, because the IRA was fighting us in Belfast, and so nobody had any bullets that didn't have to have them. So we're going out there, and when somebody says, where's the bullet? And the guy says, exercise over <laughs> when they ask for the bullets. But that was just my home guard experience. Well, what did your parents do when you were young? Do you remember? What yes. Was, what was your dad doing? Every, every night when the Germans started their air raids over Belfast, mm -hmm. because we had Harland and Wolf, which was the biggest shipyard in the world. Did your dad work at that shipyard? Pardon? Did your dad work at that shipyard? No, he was working in the building trade. Oh. And uh, they were building the, uh, the new law courts in Belfast when they got their own government that England granted us the government, so we were building the big law buildings, and my dad got the job of making the new gates and all of that stuff. Oh. So he was a hard-working guy, and hands like iron, uh, because he did a lot of cement work. And Are those gates still there on those government buildings? They probably still are. I would oh. think so. I don't know why they wouldn't take them away. They were, I think, made the last 100 years. <laughs>
Wow. And Jim worked at the gas works. Huh. And that's where they, 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 they had these big furnaces and that's where they created the coal gas. They heated the, they hated the coal, but wouldn't let it burn. And so then they had these big suction devices that caught all of that coal gas and it wasn't allowed to catch fire. Mm -hmm. And then they had, you've seen these great big multi drum in other cities where they've had oil and stuff, mm -hmm. but they caught all natural gas. And then as they, they accumulated the gas, they telescope, and some of them were up three buildings high full of gas, Wow! natural gas. How old was Jim when he went to work? Pardon? How old would uh, Uncle Jim have uh, been? Jim was probably 17, somewhere in there. And Bill became, uh, we were all looking, see in those days, every place had apprentices, polishers and carpenters and stone masons. And they even had the guys that threw the bricks to the other guy when second stories, they would throw those up into the air. And they were catchers. But everybody had an apprenticeship so that you could grow into a trade. And so, no problem. Everywhere everywhere there was apprentices, you could do what you wanted to. Oh. And of course, I was still in school. So there was a place. It was like, uh, it was the next building where they had made whiskey at one time. And so they turned it into a, a boys club where you could go and exercise, you know. So my favorite place was the rings. They'd lower the rings from the ceiling and you could grab the rings and then it would pull you up and then you could do exercise on the ring. Okay, so that was a kind of a little pastime in the evenings I used to do. So one, one evening a guy came over and he wasn't a very, he wasn't the brightest star in the, and the firmament by any chance, he was just a little bit off center, you know, not quite all there. And so he came in and he says, why don't you have me lift you up on the ring? So I said, hey, that's great. So I held on to the two exercise rings and he held me up about 10 feet in the air. He put this thing around the little holder where you, you know, zigzag it around and it locks up. Mm -hmm. And then he left and put the lights out. <laughs> I kid you not. And I, here I am in total darkness hanging by my feet, thinking he was going to come back and he never did. And the longer I waited, my head started pounding because I'm upside down. And I thought, oh, how, what am I going to do now? The only thing I can do, but I waited too long, was to straighten up and grab, the, grab the, the ends of the thing that held the rings and let go and drop and where, where, wherever the floor was was where I was going to stop. But I had been hanging upside to the line, my head was pounding and I just could not get enough poop to straighten up and grab the ropes. And I was trying to do that when my feet slipped out of the rings and I went head first in the dark oh, and busted my wrist, yeah. Busted yeah. your jaw? My wrist. Your wrist, oh my God. One hand hit out first and it broke my wrist. And it did something to my fingers, but my broken wrist was the big thing. Now in those days, there was only one doctor and he was a black doctor. The only black doctor that I had ever seen in my whole life lived in Belfast and anyway, he was miles away, and the only thing we had, we didn't have ambulances or anything like that. But quite a few people even had a car back then. And so had to wait on a tram car coming along, the electric tram, and go all the way across town to the hospital. The only big hospital was in downtown. Had to go all that, all that way with, with my wrist busted. And anyway, the fighting that was going on in Belfast between the Protestants and the Catholics, that was spilling over. And so what would happen when the, the Protestant half 
buses arrived at the Victoria Hospital, they would take the buses over. Yeah, the opposition, the Catholics would take the buses, let you off at the hospital and take the buses and burn them. Oh my God. Yeah. And so this is, this is the, the atmosphere in which we were seeking to have my wrist fixed. And anyway, I got it all done up, and by then I think I was just turning 13. And so I couldn't go to school, couldn't write anymore, couldn't do anything. And that was the end of my education. I never did go back. Oh my gosh. I was all done at 13. Oh my. Yeah. And so then my brother, he says, you can't do nothing in this world. Why don't we get you into the shipyard? Because it's the biggest shipyard. They built the entire ship, engines and everything. And so I got to work in the engines for Harland and Wolf that built the Titanic. Wow. Yeah, that wow. same thing. And so that's where I wound up. Bill wound up as a French polisher. He completed his trade. And Jim... What's a French polisher? What's that? That's finishing, you know, you see the, the tops of bars and stuff shining. Mm -hmm. Well, that was doing all that hand rubbing of the, of the call it French polishing. Oh. It took an awful lot of while rubbing to get the smooth surface and stuff. And anyway, Bill was in a sheet metal shop. That was his job. So anyway, Jim got in a fight one day and hit the boss for some reason of Jim. So he got fired. Jim, that took him out of his trade. And Bill, the place he worked, some guys that were fiddling around after work with the acetylene, we had these big acetylene bottles, you know, for lighting off the hot torches. And someone had been playing around with one of those and had broken the control on there. And so the next day when the place opened up, the big bottle couldn't, wouldn't work. And that's what everybody used to sharpen the tools with. And now they all lined up, everybody that was worked for that company were all lined up. And the guy walked on the line asking him, do you know anything about the guy that did or the person that racked that thing? Because you're going to be fired. And the, and the answer is, no, I didn't know anything. And they said to my brother, we knew you were working here at the time that that was done. It was done in the evening. And so he said, well, I can't tell you. And they said, you can't or won't. He said, well, I don't want to say either way. And so that got them to fire. So he lost his trade too as a sheet metal worker. They fired Bill and Jim. He was fired too for fighting. Oh my. And now these guys, Jim, Bill joined the Air Force and Jim joined the Army. Oh. Yeah. Because the war was underway. Pardon? So the war was underway. That so was the like... war was underway. And Jim was riding a dispatch on a motorcycle taking, you know, hot uh, instructions. They, they didn't have all of this communication like they had today. So the dispatch writer had to personally carry the information between to officials, you know, what was happening in the war. Would that have been in Belfast? So that he did. Was he in Belfast doing that? Oh no, he had to go over to England to do that. He wasn't, okay. The army took him over there. And now Bill, he fell, in, he fell in love with an English girl and her father happened to be an officer in the RAF. So he got Bill to join the RAF and he would never tell anybody what it was what he did in the RAF. And so it didn't come out until later on when I was visiting there, you know, when I was an adult, what he did. He was an explosive expert. They taught him as an explosive expert. So he had to go around anywhere where there was an RAF station and check out all the bombs and everything for that they hadn't, that nothing had deteriorated. So he would take them to the bomb range and, and explode them and measure the strength and all that stuff. And the reason he wouldn't tell anybody, 
because the Irish Republican Army were still fighting the British in Belfast. Wow. And so he was afraid that they knew he was an expert and had been in all of the RAF stations and knew where everything was, he would have been a prime target. So that's why he kept his mouth shut. He didn't even tell my mom what he did until after the war was over. <laughs> oh my. But that was, that's probably enough to, to keep you going. And, uh, but, uh, Can you remember, like, at school? Did you have school lunches, or did you bring food to with you as a oh, in grade no, school? Oh, no, nothing like that. You had to carry a wee sandwich with you, and we walked to school. Oh, yeah, got to tell you this. It was during the coronation of the, of, uh, the, the Queen's father, when they were, when he was the, being king. They had the coronation, and so they came to visit Ireland, Belfast, in a, uh, a carriage. And they were supposed to drive down, you know, the main streets and wave to all of the peasants, you know. So anyway, I was just young then, and the only best viewpoint that we had was a big horse pulled, a four horse pulled big furniture van. And so the kids had gotten a ladder and the little kids like me were climbing up and sitting on top of this big furniture van that was alongside the road, was on a little slope. And so all those kids were sitting on top of there and here comes the royal carriage. I could hear them in the distance. And then all of a sudden there was soldiers everywhere. And what had happened Somebody pulled away the wedges that were be behind the wheels of this furniture van because it was just parked on the side of the road and it was in a little bit of a slope. And that big furniture wagon that rolled out <laughs> across the highway where the, the king and queen were going to be <laughs> coming down in their car. So they oh sounded the alarm, they thought it was going to be an assassinate. <laughs> Oh my. With us kids up there, and then they had to pull us all off of there, you know, and the cops were telling us, we're going to take you home and get your bum scalped. Scalping the bum was a good punishment. Scalping the bum? Yeah. <laughs> you drop your pants and Spank bare it. hand, you scalp your bum. So <laughs> they, they threatened to take us home and get our bum scalped. But that was the exciting thing that had happened. The Queen's. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Oh my. When, but, did, when did you get indoor plumbing? Do you remember? When did what? Get indoor plumbing, plumbing in your house. We never did. Oh. We had to move. See, this was, uh, this was uh, 47 Houston Street. And then we had no electricity. Everything was gas cooking, gas heating. And we had big chandeliers that all had little burners in there and they fire off all these little jets. And that was a big chandelier that heated the, the, uh, the, the, the one bedroom where you kept all of your guests. Wow. Yeah. Did you, how old were you about when you moved from that to a house that had indoor plumbing? Now, what was that? How old were you when you moved from a house to a house that had indoor plumbing? Oh, when, when Jim joined the army, see? Oh. And that, that freed the bed up. Oh, that was the other thing. We lived in, in Houston Street, it was a two bed. And so we had two at the bottom and me between their feet on the other end of the old straw packed bed. Oh my. There you had to pack your own bed with straw. And then I tell you, whoever strapped in a, in a, a, a straw back mattress, you're in for a thrill. You turn in the middle of the night and the stem of those those uh, pieces of hay would stick through the 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 uh, sheet on the bottom and ram you because they were nice and tight and then this bunch would stick through the thing and jam right into you even when you were sleeping. Wow. I and not only that, I had two feet on each side of my head. Oh my. They were on the bottom and I was on the other end. So I remember you talking about your clothing when you went to school that um, you had one jumper, which is a sweater, 
right? That you had to last a long time. Am oh right? yeah. We used to get all of our clothes. We couldn't afford to buy new clothes. There wasn't uh, the big, uh, I mean, there wasn't the big things on TV. There wasn't any TV back. Well, that's the other thing. There was no television or anything like that. Right. Yeah, that was, I grew up with all of that stuff. <laughs> but uh, we used to go to there and it was in the maize market. And we had to pass a piggery that, that uh, was a slaughterhouse for pigs. And when we go over the bridge over one of our rivers there to get to downtown where the thing was, you could hear all the pigs squealing as they were pulling them off the trucks. And to this day, that bothers me. Yeah. I, I just can't even think of eating, going, I've got a bacon cooking and all of that. And I have eaten some bacon, but I always still think of the memory of those little poor pigs. Aww. And anyway, we'd go down there to a place called Bay's Market, and that was run by the Catholics because it was in the center of town. And they they sold everything there. You could buy shoes and shirts and coats and all of that stuff was all used. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I had gotten shoes that didn't fit me. And the guy must have had pigeon toes because I developed pigeon toes an awful long time. And I had pigeon toes for a long time because of the shoes I was walking around and somebody else that had pigeon toes. And so my feet were turning in all the time. Oh my. And then they had a butter and egg market there at the same time. And they would put out, this is true, all the different kinds of country butter they had, that's what they called it, country butter, had special salt and stuff in it, but the, the blocks were about this square of butter sitting on a piece of wood. And then you could come along, and as long as you took a silver coin, see all the pennies and halfpennies and everything were all copper and you were not allowed to use that copper that was dirty. So if you used a silver coin, you could scrape chunks off that butter and lick it. And then that was okay, but you couldn't use copper. <laughs> and so that was a way to buy it, to taste your butter before you bought it. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's great. But I, I never knew anything new for a long time. Yeah. So how did you learn about your apprenticeship? How did you pick yours? My brother Bill did all of that. He did. Okay. He was a good writer. Bill was excellent. And I just, I didn't care less. I was so stupid. I hated everything. I hated the teachers. Nobody, nobody in all the years I've been around ever came to me and you've heard it where the teacher comes up and says, son, you need a little coaching or you need a little help. Just stop after school and I'll help you. Never. It was always this for not doing that. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then we had, I still have to talk to, to my cousin because he, he followed me in school. And there, there was a, uh, a female teacher that taught us history. And her name was Annie Blue Drawers. <laughs> and so Annie Blue Drawers had the long old drawers on that came down to their knees with elastic around there. And she would sit and she would cross her leg. And all you could see was these blue drawers. So we nicknamed her Annie, Annie Blue Drawers. But she was, she was bad when it came to, she taught handcrafting, making things out of raffia. You know, we take cane and wind them around and make mats and stuff. So that'd be like an art class? Or cl oh no, that was just, you made these, that was part of your training was to make these mats and weave it with your fingers and stuff. And every time I ever showed up, and you always was never finished in one thing. You put your name on and then next week when you came, you called your name and gave you back your messy stuff. 
and mine always was messy. And when she held the light, she always had the cane in her hand. I mean, you reached out for it, you got your knuckles wrapped and said, your hands are dirty. Because we used to play and, and break outside. We were active kids, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, it, uh, it was nice and nothing like today. And I hated school. Oh, I hated so, school. One more, um, one for today, for today's part of our interview. <laughs> one of my favorite stories was one where you talked about well, I have two favorite stories. Maybe we'll get two in. So if you go quick on them. So um, we've got the one where you would go out and you would drink the beer off the top of the beer. Oh. Cake. And the other one was you'd go to the fish and chip shop, shops and drink okay. the vinegar. So those two stories. Well, I'll tell you about okay. the beer. And that's where I first learned that you can accomplish things if you have enough little energy to do it. You accomplish big things, but you can't do it individually. And that was at the pub. They had these big casks, bigger as we were, were about this tall. And they were filled with beer. And, and you called what, them a wicker? Pardon? What did you call them? It was it's beer. Beer, but you called it a container? They're a barrel. The container was a barrel? Yes, a, they were barrels a barrel. of beer. Oh, okay. Or kegs. Kegs, okay. And anyway, so they rolled these kegs from the parking lot on a little truck, rolled them into the pub, and then they put them on a trestle. And that little trestle was lower in the bar side than that. And that was to drain them as you emptied them. And all of those barrels all had wooden plugs. When they filled them with beer then, they had a wooden hole, they had the hole on the top. It was tapered, and then they put this plug in there and hammer it shut to keep it in there. And so we'd go around the back and we were just little kids. We could reach up and barely get our hands up on the edge of those things. And about half a dozen of us would all get around the I, one keg that we had agreed, that's the one we were gonna take. So we'd all get those, and one one would give the, the count, pull, pull, pull. And so we got that thing going and it was rocking from one side to the other. And you could hear that beer getting all fizzy inside. And then pretty soon you could hear it hissing around the cork, the wooden cork that was in there. You could hear that beer all hissing. The gas was getting out of there. And then pretty soon you got the whole top of that beer filled with beer. <laughs> then we would pull ourselves up with our hands like little like little animals, so we could get our lips over the edge of the, of the beer that had a ring around it about that deep. But that was all beer in there, and then we would sit there and go <laughs> And when I told my mom, mom about this years later, she said, you little rascal, I was wondering how you were so happy. <laughs> and he, he, I was probably half drunk and my mom didn't even know. Yeah, that was, that oh, was a great. great one. That's a great one. Yeah, and oh, then the fish. the fish and chip shop. It was run by a guy who had four daughters, and he was tr still trying to get a son, and he couldn't get that. But we Alfie was the name of the guy. We Alfie? And, yeah, <laughs> and so we'd wait until their, the business was, was slow, and then we would get down and look to see how many legs because they had, you know, little, little uh, units where there was a seat on each side and you'd get your, your fish and chips in the middle. So we look, we get down like that and we had looked to, to see how many spaces down that had nobody there. So we get down on our stomachs and wiggle our way all the way down through the ones that were occupied, keeping out to the outside so you wouldn't get caught. And then we'd get back in, and then the little head would go up there, and down would come the bottle of vinegar. <laughs> That's the only thing that was free, was, was vinegar. And we'd just sit there and drink all that vinegar. And I don't know how much vinegar I must have drunk when I was a kid. 
it was probably that kept me so healthy. <laughs> and vinegar, you might explain vinegar to Americans, why you have vinegar in a fish and chip shop. Very possible, very yeah. possible. Many people don't know why you have vinegar in a fish and chip shop. Well, it was because it tastes good with yeah. the fish. Yeah, it's good. It was a topping instead of ketchup. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. The English, English ketchup was vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other things the American did, if you went into a store that was selling bakery, you know, and, and cookies and stuff, mm -hmm. out came the bag where you had ordered, say, a half a dozen or even a loaf of bread, they would get the bag, it would go like that, and go <sighs> to blow the bag open. Oh, yeah. And that fried the Americans when they came over and saw these people pulling the bag and blowing all their breeze into the disease, whatever they had, and then they put what your all your food in on there and fold it over oh. and hand. That was standard. So, so the clerks were doing it, not the customers blowing their own bag. The clerks would blow oh, into it the and clerks. then get Oh my oh, goodness. Oh yeah, this is the clerks. Oh this, that's good. This frost is Oh my gosh, I'm sure it so is. So they finally got around oh, and, my gosh. and and taught all the all the the, the uh, keepers at these places, snap the bag, don't don't blow into it. And even today, they still snap with rag. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. All these things the Americans brought, you know. See, on the money system, the lowest denomination we had was a farthing. One farthing, and it was made out of copper. A little tiny thing about half a, oh, maybe three quarters of an inch in diameter. And that was a, the least value little coin was a halfpenny. And then we had farthings, four, and the four farthings made a penny. And then we had uh, three penny notes. And then we had three penny coins. Then we had sixpence. Then we had a shilling, which was 12 pennies. Then we had a two shilling piece. Then we had a half a crown, which was a two shilling piece plus a half. And that was another coin, two and a half. That was two and six. Yeah. And then uh, we had a one pound note. And then we had five shilling notes. Oh my. <laughs> then we had 10 pound notes. And then we had 20 pound notes, which I never ever did see. I never had that much money. <laughs> but I had all these coins. And the Americans would say, put down, maybe give them a, a $10 bill. And they would look at that there and they would have all these coins in their pockets. And wherever they would go, they'd get like this and say, take out of there what I've got. Oh my God. I mean, just insanity. And the coins and the coinage was different. The rules were different. It was from the king's nose to the tip of his fingers or the bottom of his jaw and and all of that old stuff. They did all of that stuff. But anyway, <laughs> the money system was just wild. Yeah. I used to give a penny, which was two hypne uh uh that would be be two halfpennies, four farthings. <laughs> and you could get something for all that stuff. You could go to the store and for one fourth of a penny buy a, a, maybe a carrot and a piece of something uh, to eat and you could get something for it. What was your favorite treat as a child? Like a chocolate. A, chocolate. Okay. Oh, all right. Cadbury's chocolate. Oh, that's British. And then you could see we got, ultimately, when we grew up more, we had two pennies. Two pennies a week was our allowance. And then you'd head down to the, the little sweet shop, and they had a Christmas club. So then you gave them a penny, and they had a little book with your name in it, and then... And then at Christmas time, you'd have enough money to buy a box of chocolate. Oh my gosh. Oh, That's yeah. a precious. Anyway. Oh, precious. So, 
kind of silly. No, wonderful, wonderful. It's just some of the things that I haven't thought of half of the stuff. But, but that business of two guys at the bottom of the bed and me sleeping between their feet, oh God, I remember how awful that was. <laughs>